Hey gang, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where I'm having a blast, as I always do, having conversations on the Beatles with all kinds of people in the Beatle world, authors, podcasters, musicians, you name it. And this time out, we have Paul Sally with us. Last year, he released a book, which is called, let me get it out here, Little Wing, the Jimmy McCulloch Story. This is a very thorough book on the life of Jimmy. He lived only 26 years. And in that very short amount of time, he made a lot of music and was in a lot of bands. And we're gonna talk a lot about his time in Wings. But first of all, Paul, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Thanks for having me, Ken. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I've been wanting to talk to you for quite a while. And um, you know, I'm fascinated by people who wanna do a book on someone like this, who I think there's never been a book written about Jimmy before, right? Oh, that's correct, yes. Okay, so it's kind of like a few years ago, Jim Birkenstadt wrote a book on Jimmy Nickel. <laughs> you know, it's great to find a subject like that in the Beatle world that very little has been written about. But um, let's go back to your beginnings. How did you discover Wings? And were you first a fan of the Beatles? Uh, so I first discovered Wings through uh, Wingspan. Um, I had just gotten into the Beatles um, the pr previous winter. Um, so then I was a big Beatles fan. And then I saw, I think it was a television commercial for um, Wingspan that was going to be airing on ABC, uh, I think in May 2001. Uh, so being that Paul is my favorite Beatle, um, I was really looking forward to watching uh, the documentary. And so that's how I first discovered Wings and uh, uh, Jimmy was through Wingspan. Okay. How old were you at this point, if you don't mind my asking? Um, I would have been 13. Okay. So you, was, you wasn't really familiar with Wings music prior to Wingspan because they got tons of radio airplay. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, if, if I heard a song on the radio before I discovered the Beatles, I probably wouldn't remember um, but apparently we, we listened to oldies growing up, so it's possible I, I heard some wing stuff on the radio, but I just don't recall um, it in my, my memory. Hmm. So what made you decide to write a book specifically on Jimmy? Uh, so uh, through Wingspan, uh, being pretty young myself, um, I was drawn to Jimmy and I was like, oh, you know, there's this cool young um, guitar player playing with Paul McCartney at however old he was 20 uh 2021 20, and so that kind of sparked my interest and led me to um seek out more information about jimmy uh which i quickly discovered there wasn't that much out there on him um i think there's a great uh website on uh, geocities um if you remember geocities um about jimmy's uh career and session work so that was a that was a great resource for, resource for me but uh other than that um all that was really said about Jimmy and the like Paul bio biographies or the rock history books for just little blurbs about him. So I just thought that, you know, Jimmy uh, deserved more than that. And um, his story needed to be told. Hmm. Now um, going back to his very beginnings, what would be Jimmy's big influences as a guitarist? I, I know I read early on, he, he mastered Wes Montgomery's guitar licks <laughs> mm -hmm. at a very young age. So he was into, I guess, all kinds of music. Yeah, um, Django Reinhardt, um, um, Wes Montgomery, uh, The Shadows, um, The Beatles, of course. Um, pretty much any anything that was popular back in the day made an impression on a, on a young Jimmy. Hmm. What about like the blues guitarists, like like an Eric Clapton or someone like that? Oh, I would say for sure, yeah, Clapton. Um, Peter Green, you know, all those types of guys um, definitely influenced him um, around the time he was in Thunderclap Newman, for sure. Yeah. And he is described in your book as a child prodigy. Yes. Yes. Um, so Pete Townsend discovered Jimmy when he was 11 or 12, when Jimmy's band, the Jaguars, opened for The Who in Scotland. Um, so, and Pete was just blown away by Jimmy at that age, you know, play, being so young and playing guitar um so if you're if you're good enough for, for pete townsend at 12 years old um i would say that's a pretty safe bet that you're definitely a, a child prodigy 
how did Pete discover that band enough to have them open for them? Um, I would say that the Jag the Jagars at that time had a really good following, um, a local following. Um, I think their fan club had about 700 members or so. Um, so they played anywhere and everywhere. Um, and uh, so, I mean, plus like the, you know, the young youthful image um, really lended itself well to uh, support acts um, during that time. I think uh, Jack, uh, Jimmy's brother told me that uh, I think the only bands that the Jagars didn't support at that time were the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So that's, tells you how how uh how well they did at that time huh so if you can give us a brief history before wings of because jimmy was in a number of bands there can you walk us through and give us a brief history of each and i know you mentioned pete townsend who of course played a big part with thunderclap newman and mm -hmm. and producing the album and playing bass too yep yep under the pseudonym uh but Bijou Drains. Let's see if I hopefully I pronounced that right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Jimmy's first band was the Jagars, um, and then that kind of fizzled out, and then the Jagars sort of reformed into One in a Million, um, which was uh, the first professional recording band that Jimmy was in. Um, they released a couple of singles, um, Double Sight and Frederick Hernando, being uh, their two kind of underground uh, hits um cult hits um so they were together for about three years and uh they performed like over 400 uh concerts all over um so they were really a well-oiled uh live machine um and then from there uh they sort of broke up in early to mid 68 and then jimmy went on to, to join thunderclap newman with uh, andy newman and speedy keen which of course uh they had that wonderful hit with something in the air, mm -hmm. which uh, made Jimmy the number the the youngest uh, guitarist in the UK to, to reach number one when he was sixteen. So that's a cool little tidbit. Yeah. And then, so Thunderclap was around for a little over two years, and they split up in 1971, which uh, Jimmy went on to join uh, John Mayall uh, for a brief uh, tour in the fall of 71 and then he had his own band originally called bent frame uh but it soon morphed into the jim jim mcculloch band and they went on to support mountain on a, a uk and uh, european tour which uh, they played the rainbow theater and uh so from the jimmy mcculloch band uh jimmy went on to join stone the crows after the tragic unfortunate passing of their guitar player uh, les harvey in uh, 1972 and then so they were together for about a year and um, so it's in while well, it's on the crows where jimmy meets up with uh, colin allen who was jimmy's songwriting partner for the later wings hits uh, medicine jar and uh, wino junko so it's during that time that medicine jar was written and uh, there's some there's a demo that uh, some of the crows did at that time which I think was like the first sort of run through, uh, which would have been on the next Crows record if they hadn't broken up in 73. So some of the Crows breaks up and then Jimmy briefly joined a band called Blue, which um, they later w went on to join Elton John's record label. Um, so Jimmy was in Blue for a few months. Um, he put on their single, uh, Little Jody, and then he did some live and uh, radio sessions with them before leaving and then he was gonna form his own band uh with uh pete french of cactus but uh that fell apart and then he hooked up with uh paul london mccartney and denny lane in paris for the susie and the red stripe sessions so that's sort of uh jimmy's first sort of introduction recording wise to uh with paul and then uh he did the uh, jimmy did the mcgear album and that's sort of what uh led to his uh joining the wings okay let's backtrack a little bit because you covered a lot of ground there yeah i was curious to find out since something in the air hit number one and, and jimmy was 16 how did he react to all the success at such a young age was it easy for him to take in or did he feel enormous pressure to have the success continue 
Uh, well, I think anytime you reach number one, I think there's uh, probably an enormous pressure to keep going. But, you know, I can't imagine being being that young and having a number one. Um, you know, neither Jimmy or Jack or any members of Thunderclap Newman thought that their song would, re would reach number one, um, you know, right off the bat. Um, so that put an, an enormous amount of pressure on them, you know, to keep going and uh you know the balloon sort of popped after something in the air which is pretty unfortunate um i'm sure it, it didn't help that their follow-up single uh funnily enough described by the musical papers as their rush-up follow-up follow single which was released in 1970 so a full year after something in the air came out was their next release um you know i i think if something in the air would have you know topped topped off at you know in the somewhere in the top 30 that would have i think been better for them but uh you know sometimes you know for whatever reason it just hit the right chord at the right time and you know people really gravitated towards it so why why did jimmy leave the band because they still continued on with different lineups um i just think you know um at the time uh, I think sort of like personal issues um, between sort of, you know, Speedy and Jimmy um, and, you know, with Andy um, not being a rock musician at all, you know, their personalities really didn't, didn't mesh all that well. Um, so I just think it was time for them to go their, their separate ways. What, uh, which is unfortunate because at the time they broke up, they were, they were a really good lineup. Yeah, it's just it's it's remarkable. It's it's got to be really tough to leave a band after you have a number one hit. You know, that's yeah, the, for sure. When you wouldn't want to leave a band, you want to <laughs> keep the success riding and all. And you've got the backing of Pete Townsend too, so that's got to be working in your favor. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I mean, I love Thunderclap Newman, and their album uh, Hollywood Dream is my favorite album of, of all time. It's just such an eclectic you know, album of uh, a whole bunch of different songs. And um, I highly suggest people check it out if they haven't. I mean, Thunderclap was so much more than just something in the air. Yeah. Did you see Jimmy, his his guitar style progress as you go through all these bands? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, he had his his blues apprenticeship with uh, with John Mayle. Hmm. Um, and then he joined up with Stone the Crows, another you know blues, blues rock band. And then he sort of drifted away from that after he left Stone the Crows and joined Blue, uh, which was more you know kind of softer and laid back, more sort of melodic type of songs. Um, you know, so there's a different style of guitar playing there. And then you know, joining up with the the pop master Paul McCartney with Wings. Um, you know, so Jimmy got exposed to a whole bunch of uh, different sorts of uh, guitar styles in his in his uh, playing. Yeah. So you said the first recording session with with Paul was Seaside Woman, Susie and the Red Stripes. Um, how did that happen in the first place? Um, well, <clears throat> so so Jimmy's brother uh, Jack told me that. Uh, so after Jimmy left left Blue, you know, you know Jimmy's you know, services was kind of well known in the in the music business at the time. And um, so Jimmy got a phone, he got two phone calls in the same day. One was from uh, David Bowie to join up with him. With him. Um, well, it was from uh, his wife, Angie, wanting to know if Jimmy wanted to join, to join up with David. And then the other one was from MPL, who asked if uh, Jimmy wanted to do some work with Paul. And uh, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. But but uh, so so I mean, J Paul Paul knew Jimmy. He he knew Jimmy and Jack. Like you know, Jimmy and Jack, they knew all the all the Wings Road Crew. Um, you know, Jack went went to boxing match, matches with Jimmy or with uh, with Paul before Jimmy joined Wings. So you know, they they were in the same orbit, and you know, they knew of each other. Um, and I don't know if if you've heard. Um, some of the radio interviews that Paul did during the 76 tour, but uh, he, I think Paul was speaking with um, uh, one of the New York guys, but he was saying how, 
how uh, he had always wanted Jimmy to join Wings, but but uh, Stone the Crows were still going on at the time. Um, so I thought that was an interesting tidbit there. Um, and 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 Paul first heard of Jimmy when he was in Thunderclap Newman. Um, it wasn't in the the Get Back film, unfortunately, but uh, there's some there's some audio of Paul and Michael Lindsay Hogg talking about uh, Jimmy and Thunderclap Newman. And I think Ringo chimes in with, uh, you know, how, how he looks so young, but he plays like he's 80, which is pretty funny. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. okay. So, um, the audio of that. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're referring to, uh, there's, there's an interview that Geraldo Rivera did with, with Wings where each member talks. I mean, apart from Paul and Linda, the others get maybe, you know, one question, but, yeah. uh, but that's still significant anyway. Um, so the McGear album, was that looked upon in a way as an audition or did, did Paul already know because he was so impressed with Jimmy's guitar playing at that point? Um, I would imagine that it was kind of an, an audition um, because it was through Jimmy's guitar work on that album that Paul extended the invitation to join Wings. But I mean, I'm sure with Paul, because, you know, I'm sure because Paul, you know, calculates everything out that I'm sure he's probably thinking about Jimmy being a potential replacement for Henry um, even prior before the McGear sessions. But. Hmm. OK. All right. So and, um, I, I kind of feel like you know, when you listen to McGear. It's got incredible guitar playing from Jimmy on there. And. Um, especially uh, like given Grease a Ride or what do we really know? I mean, it's signs of things to come. There are, there are times that I listen to Jimmy's guitar playing and yes, I guess he has a style all his own, but sometimes I feel like it sounds like something Paul would play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you feel that way. Um, you know, I've always felt that Jimmy, you know, he, he has his own, his own style. Like if you hear, like if you hear the maybe I'm amazed live soul, you think, oh, that's Jimmy. Like, so he had his own style, his own personality. Um, unfortunately, I'm not musically inclined to think, like to know the, sub the subtle differences between like each player, but like Jimmy, I know obviously. Um, but it's funny you mentioned like, oh, it's something that Paul would play. Cause I think there's a, a bit of a, there's a, a bit of confusion on some of the London town stuff in terms of, you know, did, did Paul play this lead guitar lick or did Jimmy play it? Mm. Which is interesting. I always, I always thought Cafe on the Left Bank was Paul playing it, but it's really Jimmy, the lead guitar. Mm -hmm. Because that sounds like a, you know, a Paul lead guitar part. Yeah. <laughs> in in yeah. my ears anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one that I was thinking of was uh, Don't Don't Let It Bring You Down, mm. that electric guitar. Because I know they recorded it on the boat, but um, I'm not sure if they recorded the electric guitar on it. But hopefully, with the upcoming reissue of One in Town, we'll get all that stuff cleared up. Yeah, let's hope uh, that that's coming out. There are rumors. Fingers now. crossed. Yeah, for that and back to the egg. Can you tell us anything about the McGear sessions? Enlighten us about anything you might know about you know, what it was like for Jimmy to work with Mike and Paul and everybody else? Uh, so I spoke with Mike um, about Jimmy for the book. And, you know, he was just blown away by Jimmy's talent and, you know, being so young. And, you know, he said that Jimmy delivered the goods and the guitar tandem of Jimmy and Denny was just amazing to watch. Um, you know, they they just sort of you know gelled and they had that that magic together um so the drummer for the mcgear album uh gary conway mm. uh, i don't know if you know but he was also invited to join wings after the mcgear sessions wrapped up but he had uh, other commitments i think he was touring with cat stevens maybe but um so unfortunately he didn't get to join wings but um but I think that's really about all, all that I know about the session specifically. 
um, was what Mike told me. Um, and of course they recorded it at uh, 10 CC Strawberry Studios right. in Stockport, which um, Eric Stewart took some really cool photos of Jimmy, Paul and, uh, and Linda during that time. Um, the photo of Jimmy is in the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, how many members of Wings were you able to interview for, for this book? Uh, I talked with uh, Howie Casey, Tony Dorsey, uh, Joe English briefly. Really? Um, that was just uh, through a voicemail that he that he left me, um, where we talked a little bit about Jimmy. Um, um, and then these interviews didn't make the book, but I talked a little bit with uh, Denny Sywell and uh, Lawrence Juber. Um, I talked with Steve Hawley as well. Um, unfortunately, no, Paul, but um, he did give me permission to, to use some photographs from his archive, which was pretty cool. Hmm. What about Denny Lane? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, apparently, he's saving his stories for his own book whenever that comes up. Okay. Hmm. All right, um, let's move on. The, the sessions for Junior's Farm and Sally G in Nashville. Anything that you can tell us about that? Got oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I also talked with, I talked with uh, Jeff Britton as well. Hmm. Um, so, so leading into that, um, you know, um, sort of Jeff kind of cleared the air with uh, the whole situation between him and Jimmy's relationship. Um, you know, people, out of, out of proportion um so jimmy and jeff did get along um you know it's just people sort of blow take a story run with it and you know it, it grows legs over the years and you know people embellish embellish it quite a bit but uh so going back to junior's farm um um sorry so what, what was your question about junior's farm again any information you could tell us about the sessions for that and for sally g um not in not in detail um i think um yeah not and not in not in detail that i remember off the top of my head um i just know that in nashville uh medicine jar was first worked on there um so as a sort of run through uh jimmy was playing it on oregon over in the corner of the room and uh, Paul heard it and was impressed by it. So that's how sort of Medicine Jar became to get uh, further worked on for Venus and Mars. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I don't know too much detailed info about, about Junior's farm. Um, hmm. Okay. What was, what was the relationship like between the entire band? Was there any problem with having Linda in the group in the eyes of the others i know i hear nothing but kind words from people like denny sywell for example about mm -hmm. this. and denny lane too but you know there's always the the talk about you know she's not a professional musician what is she doing in the band kind of thing and was there ever that kind of feeling maybe coming from jimmy or was he just respectful of the fact that this is paul's wife and paul wants her there Oh, you know, I'm sure there was when Jimmy, you know, being the professional musician that he was, you know, when um, he could be a bit short uh, with Linda, according to Jeff Britton, you know, about her playing, um, you know, but I think that's, you know, when you get into the heat of the moment and you're a professional musician, you know, having to stop more times than you would like for somebody who's, you know, you know, hasn't been a professional musician. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are multiple moments like that in your wings with Linda. Um, but from from everything that I've read and uh, from the people that I've talked to, uh, you know, Jimmy had nothing but nice things to say about Linda as a, as a person. Um, you know, she wasn't a professional musician, but, you know, she, she worked her butt off and, uh, you know, the, you know, she did phenomenal on that wings that wings tour in 75 and 76 so 
you know, she, you know, she should be commended for just how much work that she put in from, you know, not being a musician at all to growing over the years mm. and playing, playing in front of however many people during that tour. Yeah, she certainly learned her parts. And as I pointed out in many of my podcast shows, she she was part of the signature sound vocally. Oh, yeah. Wings with with Paul and Denny, mm-hmm. uh, especially. Um, you know, this is a conversation that I have in, in many of my programs about Wings. And, you know, it, it can be controversial at times. There are a lot of people who look at Wings as though it was just Paul's backup band or maybe session players for Paul. And depending upon which member of Wings you ask, you might get a different answer. Mm-hmm. And certainly from people like Denny Sywell, Lawrence Juber, to me, you know, they'd given me the impression it was very much a band. It was very much a collaboration in so many different ways. Um, you just, just bring it up Wings at the speed of sound that all five members got a lead vocal that on tour, Wing, uh, Denny Lane got five songs during the, the Wings Over America tour to sing, and Jimmy got one. And even in the early days, you had Henry with a song there, and Denny Lane had a song there. But from your um, research, do you think that, that Jimmy felt that it was very much a band and a very, very much a collaborative effort? I would say so. Um, in terms of, you know, the material, you know, Jimmy got to contribute, you know, quite a bit. Um, now, the financial side, definitely not. Um, that wasn't a band. That was just, you know, Paul, Paul and Linda McCartney. Um, so I think it, it kind of depends on which aspect you want to talk about. Um, musically, yes. Financially, no. Okay, let's just uh, bring up the whole um, Venus and Mars album and the experience it was for Jimmy to record his first full album with Wings. And, you know, I'm sure he must have been somewhat thrilled that he got one of his songs in there. Oh, yeah, Um, I think so. Medicine Jar was the first non McCartney pin song that was on a Wings album, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, if, unless you count Love is Strange, which was a cover. Right, right. Well, I'm talking about like the from the other Wings members. I have to, I have to okay. think because. Uh, well, No Words is Denny Lane and Paul together. Yeah. And uh, an Eyeliner Around didn't end up on Rodro Speedway. Yeah, but that was written entirely by Paul. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was just confused because uh, Denny sings. The yeah. majority of that one. Um, so yeah, I mean Venus and Mars. What a what a great great introduction uh, for Jimmy to you know to the world being on the the smash follow up to Ben on the Run. I mean Venus and Mars is my favorite Wings album, and um, you know it, I just think it's great from from top to bottom. Um, so for you know for Jimmy, uh, you know recording you know, in New Orleans, which had to have been, you know, amazing um, just to get the different, you know, experiences from from that location and, you know, meeting up with uh, just all the different influences that uh, different recording locations have must have, you know, made quite an impression on them. And it helps that the material was so was strong, too. How come, I know you just said you love Vita Samara from top to bottom. Um, I always love to hear different opinions about all kinds of music. And usually Band on the Run is rated as Paul's best album. Although these days, a lot of people point to Ram a lot. But uh, <laughs> when it comes to Wings albums, you know, why do you rate Venus and Mars your favorite? Uh, well, Medicine Jar is my favorite Wings song. Um, and then... Letting Go is probably my second favorite wing song. Um, I, I just love love the material on the on the record. Um, it was Jimmy's first album with Wings, and his playing on that album is just dynamite. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, love and song, beautiful. Um, you know, Venus and Mars and Rock Show, 
fantastic. The greatest concert opener of all time, along with Jet. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, I just think it's fantastic. Um, you know, the the album graphics and the the it just it's amazing. It's I can't put it into words how how incredible that album is for me. Um, and I would have to say my second favorite Wings record is probably Red Rose Speedway. Why so? I, I, so I just, <laughs> um, I just think it's so underrated. Um, you know, you have Big Big Barn Bed, uh, Get on the Right Thing, um, Little Lamb Dragonfly, and then I know a lot of people don't like Loop, but I I dig it. Mm-hmm. I mean, his his Paul's bass guitar playing on that song is probably one my favorite um wings song in terms of his bass guitar work um and then i know a lot of people also don't like the the ending of red rose but i you know i think it's i think it's great Uh, well i agree with you (laughs) but uh i mean red rose speedway was always like a near great album for me and now it's great status yes and uh i mean little lamb dragonfly is one of the the greatest songs in his catalog for sure period I, uh, you know, I wonder, I wonder how how it would have been received if it would have been released as a, as a double album, which it should have been. I mean, I think, I think uh, for me personally, the the recent uh, reconstructed Red Rose Speedway mm-hmm. is a lot is a lot. It's more fun of a listen uh, for me than um, than the original album, and I love the original album. Um, I don't, what are your thoughts on that? I'm so used to the original album as it is. Mm-hmm. I know that for a lot of young fans who don't know all the B-sides and all the stuff that's been bootlegged, you know, a lot of these other songs are a revelation. Me, all I got to yes. do is see the list there and it's all in my head and I know how it's going to sound. And I love all the other stuff that he does that he leaves off of his albums. And I think sometimes it's crazy because... Sometimes his B-sides and bonus cuts on CD singles are better than what's on the album. But I love Red Rose Speedway as it is. And I know Denny Sywell has told me on a number of occasions that the band picked the songs for that album. More for to the, do with how the album flowed uh-huh. than anything else. You know? so, th- so they picked it for the, for the double album, you mean? No, oh, for the single. Oh, okay, cool. I, di- I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's another reason why I say, you know, Wings was a band because, you know, they got involved creatively. I mean, there's more to a band than how they're paid. Yeah. But um, in terms of how they collaborated, coming up with sequencing for the songs, um, you know, Danny Sywell told me with Wildlife, their hands were on the faders. Mm -hmm. They were involved with the production of that. So there's little things like that that add to you know, the, the whole idea of there's so many ways that you can collaborate within a band. Mm-hmm. And um, my understanding has always been based on all the people that I've interviewed in Wings. I've interviewed most of them, except Paul and Linda <laughs> <laughs> and Joe English. Um, but if anybody in Wings had a good idea for the song, Paul would listen to it. And if he liked it, he'd go with it. Mm-hmm. Very often he had very definite ideas of what he wanted. But if you came up with something that he felt was better, he would accept it. So um, how did Case Jimmy point, take- Henry, Henry with my love, the guitar solo for that. Yeah, but the problem with that is that Paul liked the solo so much that he wanted Henry to play it the same way every time. That's true. So <laughs> it's good and bad in that situation. Yeah. Um, and I think Jimmy had the same sort of issue because, um, you know, Jimmy loved to ad lib and, you know, embellish, you know, little licks here and there on his songs during, you know, the live concerts. And Paul, you know, always wanted to play the songs exactly as they were on the recording. That's, I don't know. <laughs> he is who he is, but uh, yeah. I would but, disagree uh, with that. Yeah, you know, as Lawrence has said, you know, multiple times, um, it was, uh, you know, he got his master's at McCartney University. So, you know, along those lines here he is now going from relative success at 16 
And now he's touring all over the world in the biggest stadiums with one of the biggest stars in the world. How, how do you think he handled that? Was that something that was tough for him to deal with? Or was he just taking it all in stride? Uh, you know, I think it was it was tough for him to deal with. Um, you know, the you know, being in a band that big, you know, and being so young. Um, I know I know Paul and Linda, you know, I'm and I'm sure Denny and uh Joe as well, you know, tried to do their best to sort of, you know, look out for Jimmy because you know he was the youngest. He was only 20, 22. 22 23 during that that tour hmm. um you know and you have you know you have you have people who that the hangers on so to speak who you know only want to get at you because you're famous um and and so that's that's the side of the business that jimmy you know he didn't like you know he didn't he wasn't sure whether people liked him because he was the guitar player in wings or or they, if they liked him for, you know, who he was. And he, he really uh, struggled with that. Um, but musically, you know, he, he loved that tour. Um, you know, it was a humongous success and he was playing to sold out crowds every night. And uh, that's, you know, that's what he loved, loved the best. It was just playing for the people. It's interesting. You're dealing with someone at, at a very young age was used to performing in front of people. You know, he mm -hmm. had a lot of experience by the time he joined Wings, yeah. even though he was so young. So you might think he, he, he could possibly handle it better, but still it is very young to take all that in. Did he, how could, how would you describe the relationship that he had with Paul working with him? I know you just mentioned with the performing the same way live, yeah, you know, what Paul wanted, but overall, um, I think overall it was it was pretty good. Um, I know they had some instances where it wasn't so good. Um, you know, people know about the infamous show in Boston where Jimmy didn't want to come on to do the encore, and uh, Paul took issue with that and uh, gave Jimmy a looking, and then uh, I think that was. I think that was it for in terms of the issues that they had. Why didn't he want to play the encore? Um, I th I think the sound the sound might have not been exactly right to Jimmy. Um, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's that's probably a question only Jimmy can rightfully answer, and unfortunately, he's. He's not here, but uh, you know the the sound must have um, you know upset him, at, and he just decided that he's not going to come back on. Um, and uh, Howie Casey told me that that Jimmy left his guitar uh, laying against the at the amp, so you could hear the feedback, and um, it was just howling. And uh, yeah, Jimmy uh, didn't do that that one again. <laughs> So this was for what, for Soily, for the last song, or what? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because if you listen to the to the boot of that show, I think so, uh, Soily is the only one that's not from that concert. Cool. Okay. Interesting. But, uh, I mean, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy also, you know, he liked, he liked to ad-lib a little bit, you know, play a little, play things different. A little different each time and as, as we've talked about already you know paul liked it to be played exactly the same every time um so they, they had some issues in terms of that um like like during letting go um paul cut the song off short when jimmy, jimmy was you know playing the solo um so i would say for the most part they they had a good relationship on stage but there's a, a few little instances mm. uh, where they where they clashed. And what about in the studio? How well did they work together? Um, I would say pretty pretty well. Um, I didn't hear of any issues in the studio. 
that they had. So, so I would say pretty, pretty well. Um, Seemed like a lot of the guitar solos that Jimmy did were so strong, you know, and they really, they really added a lot to some of the songs from Wings that Paul must have just heard them and accepted them. For sure, yeah. Um, uh, Jimmy, you know, if, if there is one thing that he was probably best at, it was coming up with something amazing for, for, for your song in the studio. Mm. And I mean, the note you never wrote. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Cafe on the Left Bank, um, you know, the list goes on and on for the uh, just the amount of incredible stuff that Jimmy did in the studio. When the group recorded Wings at the Speed of Sound, was, it, was there any kind of a different feel at the time, considering the fact that Paul let everybody do a lead vocal? Did they feel more like a band than ever before? Was everybody happy about it? Or was it just what Paul was feeling like doing at the time? Oh, I'm sure they were, you know, thrilled that everybody was was getting the chance to do a lead vocal. Um, and that more democratic approach that was, you know, that hadn't been done before, um, certainly probably let the whole band know that this was a, you know, democracy instead of just, oh, here's Paul McCartney and his session musicians. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think the album was recorded pretty quickly as well. So they, they just did, did those numbers for Speed of Sound. And then that was, you know, pretty different from what, they had done previously with Venus and Mars, you know, going to New Orleans or going to Lagos to do Ben on the Run. Um, Speed of Sound was much more, uh, much uh, more streamlined in terms of uh, recording from start to finish. Yeah, well, they had to get some songs ready for the tour. You know, extra material to play besides Ben on the Run and Venus and Mars. And much of that tour focused on material from there. But you know, did, did Jimmy feel all along, because when I bring this up in, in my other shows, there have been times when Wings have been interviewed and all the members are on camera. And even though it's only natural, Paul and Linda are gonna get most of the questions, but the camera was on the other members for one question here, one question there. And that to me is something that was deliberate that didn't just happen that way. I mean, the other members must have felt, hey, Paul's really pushing for us to be recognized as a band. Did, did Jimmy feel that way? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, he was, you know, he was there day in and day out. He was doing everything he could to um, help promote the band that, you know, was one of the biggest in the world at that time. Um, and, you know, that's a really good point on your end um, on, band members only being asked one or two questions. Um, and I think it's the same in, in, uh, in the rock show um, at, so, at some points where the Paul, or, or the, where the Paul, where the camera is on Paul and Linda instead of Jimmy or Denny during a solo or, or whatever. But, um, you know, yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, these are all points that I like to bring up from time to time because, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a debatable issue. It's always fun to talk about this whole idea of Wings being a democracy, Wings being a band. And um, I find that the people who recognize Wings as a band are more people that grew up with them. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, there's an interview that Jimmy did shortly after he joined Wings. I think with Guitar Magazine, where they asked him about about this the same question, and he mentioned that that before Wings wasn't a band, but now with with him himself and uh, at the time Jeff uh, Britton, they would be seen as more of a band. Um, I'll have to dig out that interview and send it to you because it's it's some interesting stuff. So that must mean that Paul was going to make more of an effort to bring mm -hmm. the other members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, how often did Jimmy write? 
I mean, you've got the two songs there in Wings, and he, he wrote with Colin Allen. So did he write more than that? Did he have more of an interest in writing, or did he really want to concentrate on the guitar playing? Uh, he didn't write too often uh, during that time, but, uh, but I'm sure, you know, being around Paul and seeing how prolific of a songwriter he was uh, inspired him to write a, at least a little bit more. Um, I know he, he, he wrote uh, a song that ended up on his solo album, or solo, as a solo single, uh, Too Many Miles with, with Colin that was released during the Wings days. Um, and he talked about doing a solo album as well for two or three years that he was in Wings that unfortunately he never got around to, to doing. But, um, you know, he, I would say mostly he fo mainly focused on, you know, the, the guitar and not so much writing per hmm. se. Is there any indication, I've never read anything about this, that um, when Jimmy and Joe left during the London Town album, when they quit the band, that Paul might have wanted to continue with the same kind of democracy as there was in Speed of Sound with everybody getting a lead vocal. We'll never know. I mean, you do know, of course, Denny Lane had a couple songs of his own on London Town, but Mm. Was there any talk at all of possibly, you know, Jimmy had Jimmy having another song that you know of? Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately not. Uh, Paul dropped the idea of putting any more of Jimmy's songs on Further Wings albums. That's uh, what his brother Jack told me. Um, so that's why, that's why, uh, you know, Jimmy wanted uh, more money at the time because you know he was doing his part in being you know helping promote wings mm -hmm. and being an, an integral member of of the band you know doing what he could and so that was that was why he left um, was i unfortunately I, I didn't ask jack the follow-up question of of why paul dropped the idea but i'll have to ask him that at some point um but it's, uh, it's, one would think, you know, Jimmy had a song on Venus and Mars and Speed of Sound that he would continue, continue to get more songs on Further Wings albums mm -hmm. that he was involved in. But. And with those albums selling well, he would have gotten a cut there in the songwriting. For sure. And, uh, yeah. But it was more, the reason why Jimmy left was why? It was more because of financial reasons? It was over money. Yeah. He, he wasn't creative. <clears throat> um, uh, Jimmy wasn't getting paid his, his fair dues, as they say. Hmm. Would you know why that was? I mean, I know the situation with Denny Sywell and what he's talked about, that money was tied up in Apple. And that was then. Mm -hmm. But we're talking 1977 now or when? Jimmy yeah, 77. Um, you know, I think. I think, you know, the only, as, as Jack told me, the only members of Wings to getting money were, were Paul and Linda. And then he got some, uh, Benny Lane got some, some songwriting royalties because um, of his songs on the albums. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I'm sure like Paul dropping the idea of putting any more of Jimmy's songs on the albums that probably rubbed him the wrong way a little bit. That's probably an, an understatement. Um, so between that and um, just some various little issues here and there, in addition to the to the money thing, um, one could see why Jimmy uh, could leave Wings. Like I and I know fan like I've seen fans comment numerous times over the years, like oh how could you leave Paul McCartney. Like it's Paul McCartney. It's like I'm just like, well, you don't know the dynamics of their relationship, and you know, being in a band at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but personally, I I, I wish he would have stayed in Wings. Um, I, I, it it would have been good. 
that's really sad that Paul decided to drop the idea of having one of Jimmy's songs. I mean, I remember that time so well, listening to the radio, listening to New York rock radio, and they played Medicine Jar on rock stations, and they played Wino Junko. Mm -hmm. you know? So they were certainly in 76 with Speed of Sound. They embraced that whole album. I mean, there's a radio station that I listened to, WPLJ at the time, and they played every cut from Wings at Speed of Sound. <laughs> so this was not just the Paul McCartney album. This was Paul with the other members of the group. And Time to Hide was a huge album cut as mm -hmm. well. So it's, it's pretty sad that, that, that Paul took that route and yet still let Danny co-write so many songs on London Town. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think Denny was, was, you know, he was, he definitely had more experience than Jimmy in terms of songwriting. I mean, Denny released his solo album, um, All Lane, back in 72 or 73. Uh -huh. um, I mean, and, and he'd written with, with Paul previously um, on Wings album. So I wonder if it's because, you know, Denny had a little bit more experience um, that he was offered a, f a few slots on L London Town. Um, I'm trying to trying to think if what songs of Jimmy's would have fit London Town, like the mood of the album, because mm -hmm. I know I know his last song Heartbreaker, which was released in '79, that definitely would not have fit on London Town. That would have been more back to the Yegish. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's a possibility, that's a possibility, just Jimmy's material wasn't fitting what Paul needed for the record. Um, but I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Jimmy's family about that as, as a follow up. Well, he must have thought something of Jimmy if he let Jimmy do Medicine Jar Live. Yeah. What more proof do you need of that? So I don't think it would have been too much to ask to have one song on London Town, that was Jimmy. Yeah, uh, I don't either. I, I think you should have gotten at least a couple, but that's that's just me. Mm -hmm. More Jimmy, less Denny. How about you? Do you have a favorite wing song? Uh, well, besides Medicine Jar, um, for obvious reasons, um, I would say my favorite is Letting Go. Um, I just I love the the live track mm -hmm. uh, from, from Rock Show Wings Over America. Um, I also love uh, Big Born Bed, Get on the Right Thing, 1985, um, Junior's Farm, Girl School, <laughs> Old Siam, Sir. You know, I <laughs> I could be here all day. Um, mm. And I, I listened to your uh, to your podcast about wings and your top your top uh, songs. Yeah, like like mine, like. Ask me one day, it could be one, one list. Ask me the next day, it could be completely different. Besides the top two, I would say. Top two or three. Yeah, well, I say that about the Beatles too. <laughs> <laughs> but usually like the number one stays the same. Maybe the top two stays the same, but the others can change a little bit for mm -hmm. me. Hmm. Could you just answer why Jimmy really didn't stay in bands too long. I mean, this we're, we're talking about the whole history from the very mm -hmm. beginning. You know, he didn't seem to stay in a band for more than a, you know, a year or two years. Yeah. Was it just he wanted he you know, creative differences or he wanted to move on or, or what exactly? Uh, I would say, you know, him being young um, and not really being that patient in some circumstances and you know, just circumstances, <coughs> excuse me, happening the way that they did at the time um, caused him to leave from band to band. Uh, I think Wings was his longest stint in a band. If I'm, see, Wings, four years. Yeah, so Wings was his longest stint. Mm. Um, so, yeah, just, just being so young and um, I would say probably not being quite as, as patient um, as I guess he could have been at the time. Hmm. And probably in, in some cases, musical differences as well. 
especially with with, uh, with blue. It's got to be, you know, toughest thing in the world to leave a band that has Paul McCartney in it. You know, it's funny you talking about um, Jimmy being offered to be in Paul's band and being offered to play with David Bowie in his band in the same day. That's what I call a good day. But um, I'm reminded of Steve Holly. Steve Holly was in Elton John's band. And he left Elton John to be with Paul. <laughs> you know, how do you decide when you've got these huge megastars? But um, well, in in Jimmy's case, uh, as as Jack told me, Dave David uh, he wasn't calling the shots then. It was it was all Angie, and okay. they and they weren't nearly as professional. As Paul's MPL, as Paul and MPL were, hmm. like, like uh, Jack asked Angie, like, oh, "When's Jimmy gonna start? You know, do you want him playing with anybody else? You know, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And she couldn't come up with answers to any of those questions. Um, whereas, you know, Paul and MPL were much, much more. This is when Jimmy's gonna start. This is how much it's gonna get paid. Yada yada yada. Hmm. So that's that's the big reason why he joined. Paul and Wings instead of David Bowie. But mm -hmm. it would have been interesting to, you know, how his career might have turned out if he had joined up with Bowie. Interesting. Have you heard anything from MPL about your book? Did you send them a copy? Did you get any? I did. I sent I sent them uh, two copies. I have, I haven't heard anything. Um, but but uh, who knows? Maybe it uh, an episode or something will be, or a credit will be in the London Town issue. Who knows? Because I know that happened with um, um, Lucas' book, didn't it? On um, in the uh, in the wildlife reissue, he, his book was quoted. Which book? Um, uh, Lu Luca is it Luca Perry's book? Oh, Luca Parasi. Yeah, Parasi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a good, that's a good reference book right there. That is, I think, I think I won that book on, during one of your contests, actually. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. I it, it, was a few, it was a few years ago, but. Uh, so you play along with my trivia on the, on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you find them easy or difficult? Uh, that that one that I won that the book I found pretty pretty simple there there's some that i find extremely difficult um it just depends really but it's it's a good mix i would say so some final thoughts on wings and actually you you actually sent me some links to a few songs that uh you feel our our <laughs> listeners our viewers should check out that have jimmy's guitar work on it but you know through the years, impressions can change about certain works by certain artists and opinions can change about Wings, whether it was a real band or not, and through discussions like this and on my podcast shows. But there's always going to be a lot of people out there that, that think of Wings as being just Paul's band and that there's not much of a difference between Wings and Paul's solo career. And... Uh, it's kind of unfair for me to say this because I haven't watched Wingspan for quite a while, but I remember mm -hmm. being very disappointed with Wingspan in the sense that it didn't give enough credit to the other musicians in the group. It came across as being Paul and Linda's group, and even mm -hmm. someone like Denny Lane, who was there from start to finish, didn't get all that much credit. And when things like that come out, you don't really realize what the other contributions were from all the other members. So how do you feel? Do you think that things have changed in people's perception of wings? Um, or will it always be difficult to try to um, explain or establish wings as a real band to the general public that hasn't really studied their music and their history? Uh, I think it'll be difficult uh, because you have Paul McCartney, you know, Paul McCartney is a, the big shadow over wings. Mm. Um, and, you know, the average, music fan, you know, probably won't check out Jimmy's other bands or Denny's solo material or what Lawrence was up to since, oh. since leaving Wings. Um, 
for Henry or, you know, yeah. any, any other wings member. Um, so I, you know, I, funnily enough, I think of wingspan as Paul and Linda span <laughs> because, you know, that's what it was. And we could even <laughs> get into, uh, the wingspan album release, mm -hmm. which included solo material from before and after wings existed as a band. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, it'll be extremely difficult for for the average person, <laughs> average person, to um, think of Wings as a as a band instead of Paul and his backing band, yeah. which is unfortunate. And a lot of that's Paul's own fault. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right, some songs that uh, you were advising me, <clears throat> and and. Uh, our fans here to check out. One of them is I See It All from Thunderclap Newman. And I'm yeah. gonna provide all these links, by the way, in my description box, if you guys wanna check it out at home on YouTube, why this particular song? Uh, so this was uh, Jimmy's sort of first uh, vocal as a professional musician. Um, it was co-written with his brother, Jack, and it was released as a B-side uh along with accidents from thunderclap newman but uh so i see it all is jimmy's first vocal um which i think is noteworthy um so it, it's a good little song uh and in terms of if you want a proper understanding of jimmy's guitar guitar work with thunderclap newman check out accidents of the album version um jimmy has a minute long guitar solo about five or six minutes in it's it's incredible so accidents and i see it all mm. okay didn't didn't jimmy co-write that uh accidents no i see it all yes yes he co-wrote he co-wrote uh i see it all and the instrumental hollywood dream with uh, his brother jack okay also blue too many miles from the john peel sessions from 1973 mm -hmm. so too many miles was released by Jimmy with his, with his band White Line in 1976. And so so the blue version is the first sort of uh, recorded version that I know of um, that Jimmy did of the song. So it's a little bit different than the released White Line version, which I, I just think it's cool that uh, he did it on a radio session with a band that he was in for three months. <laughs> Like, like I, I sent it to uh, his bandmate in White Line, uh, Dave Clark, and he didn't even know it existed. He's like, oh, Jimmy never told me that, <laughs> which probably shows you how much Jimmy thought of Blue <laughs> at the time. But or it could, it could have been that he forgot about this session, but, but yeah, I, th I think it's great. And uh, finally, the Duke's Heartbreaker. So I'm heartbreaker with all three songs, by the way. I mm. listened specifically for the lead guitar work, which mm -hmm. I love. And I, I hate to keep saying this, but it sounds a lot like what Paul might play. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> so, it does. Yeah. So Heartbreaker is uh, Jimmy's last recorded um, song that was released on uh, the Duke's self-titled album in 1979. And um, if you listen to the whole the whole album, it's much different than the rest of the material on the album um mainly because it's jimmy's only song on the on the record but um you know it's it's jimmy's last song and and i sort of like to think um it's what a solo album of his would have sounded like if he had if he had lived um that sort of style hmm. okay all right finally how would you like jimmy to be remembered I would like Jimmy to be remembered as a as a guitar player who poured his heart and soul into his playing, who was a loyal friend, who was, you know, he was uh, mischievous, but also he had a he had a funny and sweet and sensitive side that a lot of people don't uh, don't know. Um, they just know what they go off of by what they read online or in the in the history books and that's not always 
the case, especially when it comes to Jimmy, who's had numerous um, stories told about him that are false, um, to say the least. So um, I would hope that people would would see Jimmy for the amazing guitar player, uh, the amazing guitar player and musician that he is, but also know that he was a a wonderful human being. Yes, he had flaws, but you know, there's another side of, of Jimmy. Hmm. Okay. Well, Paul, um, I'm going to include the Amazon link in case anybody wants to purchase your book. And um, thank you so much for doing this. And and thanks to Jimmy's brother Jack for helping you out so much with uh, with this book. And you know, maybe sometime we should do an interview together. <laughs> <laughs> you think his brother would would like to you know go out there publicly and talk about jimmy uh i'm not sure about about publicly because they're the, his family is very private hmm. um but uh you know never say never i suppose but uh you know jimmy's family is is absolutely wonderful and um you know they you know they're 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 good people so yeah okay well i highly recommend this book again it's called little wing the jimmy mcculloch story loads and loads of photos in there you've never seen before and lots of articles from newspapers and magazines by all means please pick it up and thank you paul for spending time with us thanks for having me ken okay and thanks to all of you for watching and we'll see you all soon